Well, good afternoon again, everyone. And I want to thank you for joining us virtually uh, for our panel discussion on COVID-19 and the activity at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Hi, I'm Don Elliman, and I have the honor of being the chancellor of this campus. Uh, and it's, it's a treat to come to work with the people that you're going to see on the screen every day. Uh, since our panel last October, it's obvious that much has changed. We've all learned a new letter in the Greek alphabet, hopefully our last, but one never knows. Um, and Om Omicron has really you know, taken over, dominated uh, the scene in the state of Colorado, in the nation and, and around the globe. Um, there, the, uh, there, there's even been an estimate that at its peak, about one in, in 10 people in, in the state of Colorado was infected at that moment in time or, or contagious at that moment in time, which is an absolutely staggering number. The good news is that nearly two years into the pandemic, we have a, a much better understanding of what works to keep us safe. With masking, uh, vaccines and boosters, we've learned uh, much already that we're able to quickly implement as the challenges arise and, and they may continue to do so. Um, we've also continued to come together to keep one another safe and to keep our research, our education and our clinical missions going on this campus and going strongly actually. Um, because of this community, there's no doubt that we are stronger together. Before we begin today, I wanna to thank the donors in the audience in attendance who've supported us on the CU Anschutz campus. Your contributions, frankly, have made it possible for us to do what we do. And we can't thank you enough uh, for your generosity. I also wanna thank our campus community, our researchers, especially our physicians, our staff and students have really all come together to, to provide a level of flexibility and, and exhibit uh, what I would say is immense leadership over the past really almost two years. I mean, we're a month away uh, from being 24 months into this process. Um, because of the collaboration of those groups, uh, we've been able to not only deliver on our mission, but also I think begin to redefine what excellence looks like in the future. As we begin 2022, we know that COVID-19 will continue to require us to pivot in unforeseen ways, but we also know, and we've proven time and time again, that we can rise to the challenge and we will rise to this challenge. Today, we're gonna to discuss the escalating changes we've encountered over the last few months um, and what the near, near future looks like it might bring. Um, now, let me introduce our panel. We're fortunate uh, to be let the panel to be led today by the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs and Dean of the School of Medicine, John Riley. Uh, John not only brings uh, his titles to the show, but is also a trained uh, critical care pulmonologist. So uh, he can add his own thoughts and ideas to that of, of our other two panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Michelle Barron. Uh, Michelle is Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the CU School of Medicine. And she's the Senior Director of infection Pre prevention and control at UC Health. She's gonna address the Omicron variant and its impact on hospital volumes, as well as booster shots and vaccine availability for children's. Uh, for those of you with a television set, there are high odds that you've seen Michelle over the last few months on, I can't tell you how many different news programs. We are also joined by Dr. Tom Campbell, uh, Tom is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and associate dean for clinical research at the CU School of Medicine. His specialty is in clinical trials of viral infections, which included AIDS, HIV AIDS, and now of course, COVID-19. He's gonna share insights on variant strains and what that may mean for future strains and what, what the implications are for the ongoing development of booster shots and new vaccines. While we have already uh, written out some questions for our panelists, we would also like to hear from you. Please share your questions in the chat window and Dean Riley will address them as time allows. John, thank you for moderating and over to you. Thanks, Don, and uh, happy new year to everybody. I'm glad to see so many in attendance. Uh, sad that uh, we're talking about COVID and not something else. Um, 
uh, as Don mentioned, we're almost two years uh, into this. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, kick it off um, by, uh, with a question for Dr. Barron, which is, um, uh, you know, in, in August, it was Delta, Delta, Delta. Now it's Omicron, 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 which leaves us all looking uh, at the Greek alphabet. Um, so what's different about Omicron from Delta? Yeah, so there's a couple of differences about from Omicron from Delta. The first is that it spreads even faster than Delta. So Delta was faster than Alpha, which was faster than the original. Um, but the ability for this to spread quickly is something that we had not seen previously. We thought we'd seen it with Delta. Um, and like I said, it's improved upon that. Um, with that, the other thing is that some of the symptoms are slightly different. Delta certainly made people feel, had some spectrum of symptoms. Um, but Omicron certainly seems to be more in the upper airway where people think they have colds, where runny nose, sore throat, headache, um, a lot of the upper airway things that we associate it with the common cold seem to be more of a hallmark with Omicron. That doesn't mean you can't get systemic symptoms of fever and chills and body aches. It just, again, seems to be more, people have had a spectrum in terms of how severe those become. The other thing is that we're seeing is that people that get sick from Omicron, especially if you're vaccinated, seem to be um, less affected by this. And so that's another good thing. Hospitalizations are still happening um, like they were with Delta, but again, maybe a little bit less time frame time in the hospital compared to Delta and people are less likely to end up on a ventilator, which is again, a good thing. So uh, Tom Campbell, um, uh, Michelle referenced the original variant, the alpha, the Delta, now we're on Omicron. Um, what's next? Yeah, well, I, I wish I had that crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> I wish it worked. Um, you know, Omicron, I, I would uh, say, really took us by surprise. So, you know, we've had the variants that you've mentioned, Alpha, Delta. There were also Beta and Gamma that really never took hold here. And, you know, those, those variants we saw evolve uh, from the, the original strain that came out of Wuhan. And over the, the course of the uh, first two years, on average, uh, the, the virus was uh, acquiring about five or six mutations uh, per year in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. That's a key part of the virus because that's the part that engages uh, onto the uh, receptor that allows it to infect cells. So about five or six mutations per year across spike and about two or three of those occurring in that binding domain. But with, with Omicron, it was a quantum leap, if you will, where it went from uh, that mutation rate to 34 mutations across spike uh, and almost half of those occurring in the receptor binding domain. And so that was very, very unexpected. Um, I expect that we will probably see other variants emerge beyond Omicron, but I certainly hope that they, they won't be as, uh, as big of a leap uh, in the mutation rate as we saw with Omicron, because that has impacted not only our vaccines, but also uh, some of our therapeutic options for people once they do get sick. All right, so um, uh, this is where uh, I warn all our panelists that I'm going off script here, at least in terms of order. So uh, Tom mentioned um, the impact on therapeutic options. Um, Michelle, do you wanna say a word about what available therapies are and how that differs from what we were doing maybe four months ago? Sure. So in the inpatient arena, a lot of the same therapies that we've been using that people are familiar with or at least heard of, remdesivir and steroids are still available. There's still monoclonal antibodies for the inpatient arena. It's really in the outpatient arena where we've had some changes. For Delta, we had availability of multiple monoclonal antibodies. Um, people might be familiar with Regeneron or Bemlivimab, um, but 
unfortunately, a lot of those were no longer considered effective um, against Omicron. And so we really only have one monoclonal antibody called sotrovimab, which is still really effective in terms of keeping people out of the hospital, especially people that are high risk. What's really great though, is that we have some oral options as well. So there's now a, a medication called Paxlovid, uh, which is something that you can take by mouth twice a day for five days um, and looks to be almost equivalent to what you would have received as um, in terms of the impact of the monoclonal antibody therapy. So about 89% of the individuals that took this pill that were potentially at risk of getting into the hospital didn't end up in the hospital. And that was compared to placebo. There's a third oral, there's a second oral option, a third and uh, sort of thing that we can use, um, molybenavir, um, which unfortunately is not as effective against Omicron. So it's not something that we're using as a first line therapy. Unfortunately, with all of these things, um, there's limited availability. And so right now, um, they being, they're being prioritized for individuals that are highest risk for developing complications, but we're hoping to continue to expand that. And the last but not least, and this just got FDA approval yesterday, is, um, and this is not an oral option, but it's IV, is remdesivir, which we've been giving to inpatients, has been shown in the outpatient arena when you give it for three days in a row, again, to be as good as the Paxlovid as well as the Sotrovimab. So again, that option is being offered um, and is available. And certainly if somebody gets COVID, we encourage you to make sure that you, and has risk for getting hospitalized or having progression, that they talk to their provider about getting a referral for one of these options, because it, again, can slow the progression. And I think there's so much talk about it's not as bad as Delta. Well, it may not be for some people, but it could still be very bad for others. So I think making sure you're aware these treatments exist is important so you can determine if it's the right option for you. All right, so two themes are emer emerging in the chat um, and um, uh, in our script. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, and that has to do with uh, vaccinations and testing. So. Uh, We'll start with vaccinations here because that's where everybody should start. I'm just going to say editorially. Um, so, uh, Tom, uh, you have played a key role in the in the vaccine trials. Um, there, uh, so talk to us about the uh, role of initial vaccination boosters um, and uh, the risk of complications from um, uh, vaccinations, uh, particularly as it relates to Omicron. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think that you know, some of the messaging that uh, has come out around vaccinations has been somewhat confusing and, and some of the terminology uh, gets confusing. So I think it's, it's important to, to explain that. Um, and, and it's also important to realize that the vaccinations, uh, we've been learning how to use them on the fly, so to speak. So you know, we've been in the middle of a pandemic, so we couldn't wait uh, for three years to figure out uh, all the details about the vaccination schedule. So we've been learning uh, as we go. And uh, right now, the terminology that's used is that uh, for a person with a, a healthy immune system, that uh, two doses of an mRNA vaccine is considered to be the, the primary uh, schedule. Uh, and then a third dose uh, is often referred to as a booster dose for those individuals. For people who are immunosuppressed, who may have cancer or an organ transplantation and so forth, their primary series consists of three doses and then a fourth dose is considered to be the, uh, the, the booster. The difference in the booster being that it's, it's given uh, uh, several months or more uh, after completion of the, uh, of the primary series. And so what, what we've learned is that those getting those boosters is really key for protection against Omicron. In the absence of a booster, even in an immunocompetent person, uh, the, the primary two-dose series provides very little protection uh, against, against Omicron, and getting that, uh, that, that booster dose is key. Boosters uh, have, uh, have been uh, shown to be very safe. They have the very similar uh, side effect profile that we see after the first two doses, 
sore arm, fever, tiredness, headache, those sorts sorts of things. The risk of more serious side effects, like for instance, uh, myocarditis, pericarditis, uh, actually uh, is not higher with the uh, with the booster dose. And there's data from Israel that says that it's really very uncommon uh, with the booster dose. And um, I, I will say, if one looks at the inpatient statistics now, the majority of people in the hospital are still those who are not vaccinated. And conversely, the majority of people who have been vaccinated who are in the hospital uh, have an underlying condition that um, interferes with their ability to fight off uh, infection. Um, so um, uh, let's talk about tests. Um, there are uh, tests that you can uh, get at a laboratory, in including the UC Health Labs, um, uh, and those tend to be primarily PCR type tests. And then there are tests that people can do at home. Uh, Michelle, do you want to talk about um, the pros and cons of each and um, when people should be testing and why? Sure. So obviously the home kits are easy to use. Uh, you, you know, swab your nose, you can do it at midnight, you could do it at a regular time, and then you get a result pretty quickly. So, um, and the US government is now shipping those to any, at least three kits to any family or household that wants them. And so I think that's obviously a nice option for individuals that don't have the ability to get to a testing center or have some kind of restriction in terms of their, uh, their time. Uh, the home test, the antigen test, um, can be quite useful, but they, we talk about having false positives and false negatives, and that the statistical, statistical term is sensitivity specificity. So the antigen tests are about what we call 80% sensitive, which means that 20% of the time you could have a false negative. So you could have COVID and you could still test negative. And then you do something like PCRs on the flip side could test positive, even though you were maybe ill and infectious a week or even longer. And so they both have kind of their pros and cons. Um, you have to use some level of common sense when you're using the, uh, these tests. And so if you had a known exposure and you now have symptoms of sore throat, fever, cough, anything that suggests that you have an upper respiratory infection, right now, statistically, you probably have COVID, especially with an exposure. So even if your antigen test says it's negative, that does not mean you don't have COVID. And so I think that's what I want people to understand when they're using these tests, you have to sort of use them in the concept of what am I gonna learn from this? And am I gonna change your behavior? If you have potentially implications in terms of, I really need to know if this is COVID versus maybe the flu or something else, then getting a PCR test is the next step to do. Um, the PCR test, again, can sometimes miss cases. Um, so not one of these tests is completely perfect, especially if you have mild symptoms or no symptoms, you may test negative. And then a few days later, you may test again and be positive. And it could have been that in that time frame, it was just you didn't have enough virus produced at the time to be able to be detected. So I think, again, they're great tools. I think they're helpful for individuals when they're trying to figure out like if they're going to visit somebody that's immunocompromised, but it's another layer of protection. It's not the end all be all. So use it with some judgment. It just, it's not a free, a negative test is not a free pass for you to, especially with symptoms um, that you don't potentially still need to follow some precautions. So, uh, and any difference in testing for Omicron than for um, Delta? I'll give that one to uh, Michelle. Sorry, I saw you. Uh, Sorry, my light went out. So I was sitting in the dark. Situation. You got to move more to keep that. <laughs> um, uh, any difference in sensitivity and specificity for Omicron versus 
Delta or the other variants in these tests? In these tests? Great question. No, that we we lucked out in that the testing, whether it's an antigen test or PCR, still maintains similar sensitivity and specificity for all of the variants so far. So we're lucky that we didn't also have to develop a new test to be able to detect it. And so they work really well. There's still probably an equal number of false positive, false negatives with the antigen that we saw with Delta. Okay, thanks. So uh, Tom, uh, uh, I wanna touch on one or two more topics related to vac uh, vaccinations. Um, if somebody's had two of the mRNA vaccine or a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, should they get uh, a dose, and it's been more than uh, five months, should they get a dose of an mRNA vaccine? Uh, the, the answer to that is, is yes. <clears throat> um, and it specifically, uh, even if you had the Johnson & Johnson, you should get the mRNA vaccine. That, the, they're now the preferred uh, vaccines for, uh, for that, uh, that booster dose. And I, I think it's, I can't stress enough how important it is to get that booster dose because what we've seen, we saw it with Delta to some extent, but we've, we're seeing even more with Omicron is that after that second dose of an mRNA vaccine, over time, the protective antibody levels fall and risk of infection increases and risk of hospitalization increases uh, as well. And uh, by getting that booster dose, it uh, really supercharges the neutralizing antibodies, gets them to much higher levels so that they, uh, that they work uh, better uh, for protecting not only against infection, but also boosting protection against hospitalization, which is, is really what's important. Uh, and it's really the, the biggest uh, effect of the vaccines is to keep people from getting really sick and keeping people out of the hospital. Okay, so if three is good, is four better? And if so, for whom and when? Yeah, well, certainly for immunosuppressed uh, patients, as we were talking about before, that fourth uh, dose uh, is important. And that's what's considered to be the booster dose for, uh, for immunosuppressed. There's not a lot of data yet on giving a fourth dose to, uh, uh, to people who are not immunosuppressed. And that's not something that we currently recommend. Um, and you know, part of the issue here in the US right now is across the whole US population, only about 25% of the population has gotten a booster dose. And so uh, we really need to be focusing on getting everybody immunized and getting everybody who's gotten a primary series to get that, uh, to get that uh, booster dose. It's better in some age groups, certainly you know, older uh, individuals, uh, people my age and older, uh, the, the rate of boosting is, is, is much higher than that but we, we need to get uh, high rates across the entire population. Okay, um, so I'm gonna stay with you for a minute, Tom. Can, let's talk about vaccines and children. Um, boosters in the over five-year-old uh, age range and when or will we, and if, we, if the answer is yes, when will we see vaccination for kids under five? Yeah, so, you know, the, the first thing I, I, I would say, John, is that, you know, my, my pediatric colleagues often remind me that uh, children are not just small adults. Uh, there are uh, very important physiologic differences between children and adults. And with regards to vaccines, there's very important differences in the immune systems of children, uh, particularly young children compared to adults. So it's, it's really important that we, we get uh, our dosing uh, schedule, our dosing amount uh, correct for children so that we know that we're conferring the protection that's needed and having the minimum risk to children. Because the last thing we wanna do is to, to give uh, children unnecessary side effects, potentially serious side effects from vaccines. So, so that's why it's, it's taking uh, longer is because we're, we're trying to be very, uh, very careful. And you know, right right now, uh, children uh, five and older can get a primary series, and that's what's recommended. 
Boosting is only recommended at this time for children 12 uh, and over. Um, we are still in the process of getting people, uh, children who are five, and, uh, five, to, five to 11 immunized. So it's really too early to be even talking about boosting for, uh, for, for that age group. Now the, the under, under five age group, four, four and younger, we still don't have a recommendation for um, even a primary series. And, and uh, we were hoping that we would get to that very soon, but uh, the initial uh, trials that uh, were done with the Pfizer vaccine uh, did not provide enough uh, protective antibody level with the lower dose that was being uh, tested uh, in, in that group, in, which is uh, uh, three micrograms, which is a tenth of the dose that, uh, that adults uh, receive. So it may be that they need a, a third dose to get that uh, protection, or it may be that they need a higher dose than three, three micrograms. We, we don't know yet, and, and I'm, I'm sure that that's what uh, Pfizer is trying to figure out. Thanks. Um... So Michelle, um, we've heard that it's much more effective, much more likely to give you upper airway symptoms, that if you're vaccinated and boosted, you're less likely to wind up in the hospital, um, but that at, at one point within the past few weeks, one in 10 people you walked by in the street um, was uh, infectious. Um, so when you put all that together, uh, give, give the audience here a picture of what it looks like in the hospital right now what kind of uh, uh, volumes we're seeing and, and what kind of care is being um, delayed as a result of those volumes? Yeah, so it becomes a numbers game. So because it is so widespread and even though vaccination rates in Colorado are quite good, they're not 100%. And boosters have certainly, again, sort of fallen behind in terms of how much. So we're seeing that overflow effect of people that are potentially vulnerable or unvaccinated ending up in the hospital. And again, the good news is that they're not in the hospital as long as they were with Delta, but they're still in the hospital. And the volume certainly started to go up uh, probably mid-January is when we really started to see the surge of patients coming in. And what does that mean? It means we have to postpone surgeries because we don't have a bed. If you require, unless it's an urgent or emergent situation, a lot of care that would normally occur gets delayed because we have all these extra patients that we didn't have before. And we are hoping we've reached that peak. And I think people are talking about that, but even though testing positivity maybe is plateauing, um, the hospitalizations often lag behind that. So it's not that you get sick right away and end up in the hospital. It's usually you've been sick and then five, six days into your course is when you start having issues with breathing or you start having a complication related to COVID that now requires you to end up in the hospital. So I think we are not going to be done with this for a while. And it's obviously something we're all managing, but it is taxing on the healthcare system and certainly taxing on providers who are already tired and have been working at this for a couple of years. And I think, uh, we were hopeful that since this one in theory was milder, we might have been able to be spared, but we're not. And it's just unfortunate because it does have second and third order effects for people that need, uh, need medical care, whether it's an elective surgery or not, it's a surgery that was potentially needed. Um, and we're also, again, mitigating issues non-surgical as well for care that needs to happen. So, um... Uh, I, again, this is a softball question, but I'm going to put it out there since uh, there's a bill in front of the state legislature about this. Uh, any reason to think that ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine would be effective against Omicron, which would be in distinct contrast to its effectiveness on the prior variants? <laughs> I think the the easy answer is no, <laughs> but Tom might have something more to say. <laughs> I, I would say the only answer is no. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know the so we talk about the the differences in Omicron, but really all of those differences are concentrated in the spike protein, 
there are, are there are some changes, but not a lot in the other parts of the of the virus. Um, we don't even know what the proposed mechanism is by which uh, anti-parasitic drugs like uh, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine would inhibit the inhibit the virus. Presumably, it's not via the action of the spike protein, though, and it would be someplace else in virus replication. So just based on what we know about the virus, I, I don't see any reason to, uh, uh, to indicate that uh, Omicron would have differing susceptibility to those agents than uh, previous uh, variants. Uh, thanks. Um, uh... I, I would want to editorialize for a second here and say that um, this has become a contentious issue for some patients in the hospital and their families who uh, primarily, as you might um, guess, among patients who are unvaccinated. Um, and it's led to more tension between patients and families and hospital staff than we have been seeing uh, historically. Um, so we have the uh, unfortunate combination of that tension and then the uh, understandable frustration of some patients who got vaccinated, got boosted, need some other type of medical care and are being told they have to wait a while because we're busy taking care of people with COVID. Um, so it, uh, uh, all of those emotions are, uh, on the part of the vaccinated people are understandable, but it contributes to the stress that our medical staff are um, our feeling. Um, so let's say you're like me, um, two series of, you know, a two dose series of MR vaccine um, boosted and then uh, quality time with the grandchildren followed by um, uh, an initially negative and then a positive uh, antigen test in the setting of mild cold symptoms. Uh, for somebody who's wondering uh, whether they've had Omicron, but they're vaccinated. Is there a test that after they're infected that could tell them that? I'll give that one to you, Michelle. Yeah, so the problem with, so people I know have been curious and want to do antibody testing, either to tell whether or not the vaccine took or if they had infection. And the vaccine, sorry, the antibody testing can't actually distinguish. Um, the only way, especially if you've been vaccinated, it can tell you you have antibody production, but it can't tell you if that was because you were vaccinated or you have uh, been actually infected with Omicron. Um, the only way to test is to have obviously a PCR test with or an antigen test that's positive. And I guess at the end of the day, I'm not sure that it matters if you didn't have any sort of long-term effects from it. Um, and so I think curiosity is obviously a very good thing, but it wouldn't necessarily impact what we do for you clinically right now. Um, there is, I know, some questions about immunosuppressed hosts and whether that should be a measure. I think it's important to remember antibodies are just one part of our immune response. And it's like you have the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, all your military is part of your immune system. And so we're measuring just one of those service lines. And so the absence of antibody doesn't mean that you don't have other um, components of your immune system that potentially could help you with vaccination. And so I don't want people to be discouraged that if they had a negative antibody test that their vaccine didn't work at all. It may not be as effective as if you had an intact immune system, but I think we get sort of lost in some of those details sometimes. All right, so I'm giving you fair warning, Michelle. I'm gonna ask Tom a question here, but then you're gonna to get to talk about masks. Um, so, uh, Tom, uh, uh, piggybacking on uh, Michelle's answer just there, uh, let's say uh, that exact scenario exists. Somebody's had two mRNA vaccines, got a third mRNA dose at an appropriate interval, so it was boosted, and they get Omicron. Um, are they super immune now? Is Omicron like a second booster, a fourth dose? Um, should their people change their behavior if they know they've had Omicron in that scenario? Well, I'll, I'll answer the, uh, 
last question first and the answer to that is no do not change your behavior as michelle said we are a long way from being out of this pandemic and we need to stick with the 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 game plan uh which is not only about vaccination and and uh, induced immune responses but is also about the other public health measures that we've all been practicing for the last two years so in answer to the first part of the question, though, there are emerging data uh, from South Africa that have uh, looked at um, uh, responses uh, after Omicron. Um, and they, and it, as Michelle mentioned, it's, you know, it's not just all about antibodies, although antibodies are important. That's only one part of the immune system. But uh, in terms of antibody levels, Omicron does give a, a very broad boost to uh, antibody levels. And in someone who's been vaccinated and then gotten Omicron, it boosts antibodies not only to Omicron, but also uh, boosts antibodies to other variants like Delta and Alpha and, and things we've uh, had before. Unfortunately, in people who have not been vaccinated who get Omicron, they don't get anywhere near the antibody levels that vaccinated people do. And the breadth of coverage of those antibodies is much narrower than what vaccinated people get. So uh, yes, for, for people like uh, you and me who have uh, been vaccinated and then get Omicron, uh, we do get a boost across the board that will likely protect us from other variants. For people who uh, never got vaccinated, uh, we can't be sure of that. And, and I'm concerned that they will still be very susceptible. So let me follow up on that. So let's say one of the, we have somebody who is unvaccinated, gets Omicron, um, sees the light and decides that they should get um, vaccinated. Um, how long should they wait after uh, being uh, infected before they go for that vaccination? Yeah, so what, what I would recommend is that they wait at least until all of their symptoms have resolved and they're at least uh, 10 to 14 days out from uh, the onset of symptoms. Any time after that would be, uh, would be a good time to get the first dose of, a, uh, of an mRNA vaccine and then to follow the recommended uh, schedule thereafter. All right, thanks. Uh... So as Warren, Michelle, uh, we've, we've dealt with the controversial stuff. So I'm now I'm gonna give you the easy one, masks. N95s, KN95, surgical masks, cloth masks, uh, where, when, how to wear them, et cetera. So let me just start with basics. Wearing a mask period isn't a good idea. We'll get into the technical piece, but you have to wear a mask. If you go out and about and the last probably three or four months, ever since you know the summer, the amount of mask wearing has decreased significantly. I think there are obviously mandates in some counties that require you to use them now, but outside of the healthcare setting, I'd say it's pretty variable in terms of how much masking is really happening. So first of all, wearing a mask is better than no mask at all. So let's start with that. Um, the next piece of masking is how well it fits you. It has to be a tight fit and it has to be over your nose and under your chin. If it's down here or down here, it pretty much you're not wearing a mask. And so I think those are important things get, that get lost because when we start getting into the type of mask, that fit is probably the most important thing. If you look at the data, all the data is sort of in, most of it's in crash test dummies, actually. Um, there is a lot of controversy on terms of how do you really measure that? How is the mode of spread? It is still primarily a droplet, which means when you cough and you sneeze, that spittle that escapes your mouth or nose is how this is transmitted. And it can be also potentially through fomites. And so the difference in the mask, a surgical mask versus an N95 is how much it filters and how much it filters the particle size. So droplets are very large. And so a surgical mask will filter that fine. It'll also prevent them from going out of my mask. If I cough and sneeze into my mask, it's not going to land on somebody else or end up going there. The N95s and the KN95s in theory filter these really small aerosols um, that potentially are generated when they happen. 
again, this is an area that is somewhat controversial, and I really find some challenges with what the messaging from CDC has been in terms of trying to figure out how to do this. Now, there are some people who are just more comfortable in a KN95. It fits their face better. Or more, I wear a surgical mask probably 100% of the time unless I'm in a specific COVID room with an aerosol generating procedure. All the rest of the time I wear my surgical mask because it fits me. There's no gaps. I can wear it. I don't mess with it. I'm not itching and moving it around. My husband wears a K95 because it fits him perfectly. He doesn't fit well in the surgical mask. Some people can wear N95s all the time. Most people cannot. I sort of Again, a little worried that the public was told to wear N95s when most of them won't be able to wear them consistently. And to me, that's probably the most, the cloth mask, these are better, certainly no doubt, but a cloth mask is still better than no mask. And again, the key thing is two, twofold. You're protecting yourself and you're protecting others by having this area covered, especially if you're having any kind of a symptom you really wanna make sure that you're containing those droplets so that you're not potentially infecting. What is the final answer? I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know, but I think at the end of the day, what I've been recommending, the most important piece is get one that fits you, that you're gonna wear and that you're not gonna mess with because every time you move it up and down or take it off because it's uncomfortable, you again have lost that protection. And so wearing a mask in combination with um, getting vaccinated and kind of using common sense in terms of gatherings and other things, I think is probably ultimately the right answer. And the nuance of which one is better is probably getting lost in the, the mix of all the other things. Okay, so there's a question in the chat um, and I'm gonna uh, paraphrase it. So if one mask is good, what about two? Um, the answer is probably not. It might make you psychologically feel better. But again, if you can wear two masks, that's fine. What happens is that a lot of people that wear two masks can't breathe through them. And so we get back into the now I'm fiddling with them and I'm moving them around. So um, there, I don't know that anybody's really studied to see that if one or two or three are better, I do think it increases the likelihood that you're not going to be able to breathe very well with them on. And so we generally discourage you from doing that. And it also gives you sort of a false sense of protection, especially if you don't, and if you don't have them on right, you may have two of them on, but they're not really doing what they need to do. So I think again, fit is probably the most important piece of this fit and, and then putting them on in the first place. Okay, Tom, I'm gonna to give you a really easy one from the chat here. When we will we know we can return to normal and not worry about masks? <laughs> when Michelle tells me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I, th I think that's, that's the, you know, that's the big question. We all want to get back to, to normal. I guess, you know, my, uh, my assessment would be that we'll get back to normal, but it's not going to be the same normal that we knew uh, two years ago. It'll it'll be it'll be somewhat uh, different. Uh, you know, I I hope that with vaccination and and perhaps with the you know the the spread of uh, of Omicron that we will get closer to that holy grail of herd immunity that uh, uh, that we like to talk about. Um, but you know what that that herd immunity doesn't mean that this virus is going to go away or that COVID illness is going to go away. But what it would mean to me is that it becomes manageable to the extent that our hospitals, our healthcare systems are not being overwhelmed with sick patients who are uh, uh, taking up uh, valuable resources and contributing to fatigue and burnout and, and, and other things and, and potentially dying. So if we can get away from that, then uh, I think we'll have reached what I hope will be a, a, a new normal and we can go back more towards the way that we were living two years ago. So um, that, that leads to, I guess, a theoretical question here. Given the prevalence of this variant and um, uh, the infectivity, um, 
of people who have it and the anecdotes, um, I'll give one from a university hospital, which is 25% um, of the patients being admitted to the orthopedic service with broken bones are testing positive for um, Omicron. So they're clearly a, a non-trivial number of people walking around asymptomatic, not knowing that they're infected. Um, is this acting like a, um, a mass vaccination campaign? And, um, uh, and that would lead to um, a question I've heard from a number of people is if you are relatively healthy and you've been vaccinated and boosted, should you try to avoid getting COVID? Or should you actually deliberately expose yourself to it the way we used to in my youth of kids with chicken pox? Yeah. So, so I, I would not recommend deliberate exposure. Um, you know, even though um, Omicron appears to be less virulent than Delta in, in previous uh, variants, people still get uh, quite, quite sick from it. And uh, we don't know, we don't understand all of the factors that contribute to who gets really sick and, and who doesn't. But, you know, uh, people still could end up uh, in the hospital. Second is that there can still be long COVID and, and vaccination does not fully protect against long COVID type symptoms. So, so those, are, those are still risk of, uh, of, of getting infected. So, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend the, what, you know, uh, what was done with chicken pox when I was growing up. Uh, uh, and I, uh, I, I would say, you know, just continue to follow these, uh, these precautions now. You're, you're absolutely correct that there are a lot of people who are getting mild infections. And as we uh, were talking about, if those people have been vaccinated, they're gonna have some pretty um, high levels of neutralizing antibodies against the virus. And uh, if, as that scenario plays out more and more, we as a population will become more and more immune to the, to the serious consequences of uh, uh, of COVID and we'll be moving to whatever that new normal is. So, uh, Michelle, there's a question in the chat related to uh, kids' exposure at public school, but I'm gonna expand on a little bit and ask you to talk about, um, given all the things we've talked about, the, the high prevalence in the community, the um, infectivity, the fact that people are infectious before they're symptomatic, um, uh, what is the role of contact tracing in, in this wave? Um, yeah, so I think certainly early on, it was incredibly important and it still serves a role. I think um, in certain types of settings um, where you have highly vulnerable populations like nursing homes or hospitals, doing the contact tracing is important because you want to be able to make sure that if there's more people that are going to be potentially affected by this, that you're testing them or there are controls that are put into place. When you start looking at the schools, I think it's, uh, it be, it's challenging because kids obviously um, generally have been having milder symptoms. It's a lot harder to get kids to be six feet apart all the time, the masking piece of this as well. I mean, kids should be kids. The downside obviously is that then it goes throughout. I can tell you almost everyone I've talked to who's got COVID recently that's an adult has a kid at home or has kids that they're around. And I don't know that there's anything that contact tracing would have made a difference is that once they've been exposed, it's, it's the, the chances are there that it's going to happen. With such high community spread as well, by the time the contact tracing has been completed, you kind of already know, like I, I, I'm on those alerts from CDPHE that I get if somebody's, um, if I've been around somebody that has had COVID, I get that alert that says you've been exposed. And I want to start laughing because I was rounding on the hospital. Of course I was, I was seeing COVID patients. So I knew I was, I was in proper PPE, but um, the, I think, but and this was a week later. So I know that it's probably the delay wouldn't have changed anything. So uh, I think everybody should assume with the current statistics that everybody's been exposed, their kids have probably been exposed. 
And that doesn't mean you throw down the towel and just say, I'm just gonna get COVID. I think you can still be smart about it. Um, but I think um, it's the tracing has lost some of its value because of that in sort of in a more broader sense of being able to truly contain it because there's just so much out there. Okay, so thanks, Michelle. Uh, Tom, a recurrent theme in our conversation today and in the chat and everywhere you read is um, uh, COVID vaccines work. Um, if people have received the primary series and then uh, uh, a boosting dose, they're much less likely to get sick with, um, seriously ill with Omicron. Um, and despite that, we still have a non-trivial part of the population that um, is not vaccinated. Um, and so two years into this, um, what do we know about the people who don't wanna get vaccinated and do we have any chance of, realistic chance of changing their minds? Yeah, so, so I, I, that is a, a very important part of the, the population. And I think it's very important to understand what those reasons may be. And, and there, there has been uh, uh, you know, research that have uh, studies that have looked into this. And the answer is, is that there's, uh, there are diverse reasons. Um, and some of those uh, reasons are potentially um, amenable to change, others may be less so. So some people uh, just want to see more data, they wanna see more, you know, get more time under uh, the curve for seeing how these vaccines work and, uh, uh, and making sure they're safe. And so, you know, I, I think those individuals, if that's why they're holding out, I think we can continue to have dialogue uh, with them and provide them with information that they need so that they can become comfortable uh, getting a, a vaccine. Uh, there, there are others that uh, have you know, religious beliefs that um, uh, maybe um, uh, for some reason may interfere with their getting a vaccine. Again, we can have conversations about that and, and try, to, uh, try to understand uh, what those beliefs are. There, there are some people that are um, concerned about the mRNA technology. It, you know, it's a technology that's been in development for over 20 years, but this is the first time it's been applied in such a, a large scale. There are other vaccines that are uh, still in development that hopefully we will have soon that are more conventional protein subunit based vaccines. So if someone's uh, hesitant specifically because of the mRNA technology, I expect that there will be alternatives to that uh, in the near future. Then there, you know, they're, the harder nut to crack, I think, are uh, individuals who have uh, very fixed, uh, perhaps even political beliefs about uh, vaccination and the origins of the pandemic and, and so forth. And I think, you know, we can continue to try to have dialogue with those individuals, but I think that, uh, uh, that's uh, perhaps a, a more recalcitrant uh, population. Okay, so there's a question in the chat that I'll address, um, which is the, um, uh, what is the impact the courts uh, not allowing the mandate of government employees to be vaccinated? So uh, that's not my interpretation of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, uh, we have a vaccine mandate on this campus. UC Health has one for their employees. Children's Hospital has for their employees. Denver Health for theirs. Uh, the VA um, as well. Um, I think if one looks at the national landscape, legal landscape, um, and many of these cases are only through the preliminary phases and don't have final determinations, uh, the overwhelming majority of preliminary rulings are uh, support the notion that um, employers of employees who deliver health care um, have the right um, to uh, have a vaccine uh, mandate. I will say among our university population, compliance with that mandate has been extraordinarily high. Um, uh, that said, um, the chancellor is being sued um, uh, because of uh, this mandate. Uh, so we'll see how that uh, plays out in the courts. But um, 
in the high 90s percentile of our um, university population is uh, vaccinated. I don't know the exact number for UC Health, but it's in the same ballpark. It's extraordinarily high. Um, we've had a, a small number of dismissals from both of those organizations related to people who would rather not have a job than get vaccinated. Um, but that number has been uh, very small um, and has not materially impacted our ability to um, uh, fulfill our uh, missions. All right, so uh, last question here. Um, and I'm going to give it to you, Michelle, I think. Um, with an ad adult mask fully vaccinated, kids under five with mask not vaccinated, okay to go out into indoor public settings consistently or should people avoid that for now? So I think like with all things, I think there's sort of a risk-based approach to how to do this. I am very much in favor of people living their lives. And we know that the amount of that isolation and a lot of the measures we took early on have impacted individuals. And so certainly from an adult standpoint, you're pretty pretty good in terms of not likely um, having ill effects or long-term effects from COVID if you were to get it. And probably the same for your kids and especially when they're masked. I think a lot of it is just, again, figuring out what makes sense for your household in terms of what are the risks and what are the benefits. And so being outside or going to public events or going to dinners can certainly have a lot of positive impact on you. Um, and there may be some risk though that you could get COVID. And that's when you look at your household and say, everybody's healthy, they're the ones that can be vaccinated, have been vaccinated, the impact on children tends to be mild, my kid is healthy, um, I'm okay with that risk, just like we take a risk every day by getting in our cars, uh, but we minimize those risks in those other ways, and so I think you just have to be thoughtful as to, well, am I going to uh, my friend's house who I know everybody's healthy and everybody's been vaccinated versus I'm going to a 200 person event that I don't know who's there and I may not know the scenarios that my kid or my family members are gonna be exposed to. So I think a lot of it is just thinking through like, okay, what would I do in a, a year where I'm the flu, it, the flu is circulating? Not that this is the flu, but think of it in that way where there are some people that are gonna be very negatively impacted by this. Some people may not. And then you figure out what chances am I willing to take and can I do other things to mitigate the risk of that? So um, I, I think that's the way where I land that there's maybe not a hundred percent one perfect way to do this, but there is a good way for you to make sense of it in the context of who you live with. All right, thanks. And I think with that, uh, we're close to the end of the hour here. I'm going to uh, do my mic drop and pass the baton back to Don Elliman here. I want to thank all of our attendees today, and I particularly want to thank uh, Tom and Michelle for sharing their expertise with the audience. It is my fervent hope not to have to do this with the two of you again, but um, I said that the last time we did this, so um, uh, one of these times it'll be true. But So uh, thanks again, and uh, over to you, Don. Share John's fervent hope. Uh, if there's one, one message that, and I think by following the, the principles that Michelle and Tom have laid down, uh, we can probably increase our, our chances that this may be the last time we have to do this. Uh, I want to add my thanks to the people who have attended today. It's, it's, I hope that it's been a valuable session for you. I certainly want to thank our panelists. Uh, both of you have had rather consuming day jobs for the last 23 months, and the fact that you're willing to take some time to do this today, uh, we're very grateful for that. So thank you. Um, we know we couldn't answer every question uh, that that people had in the chat. We do have a a, uh, a, a web presence that it's called news.cuanschutz.edu for the latest information, and I encourage you to visit that site uh, for for uh, the latest information. But uh, in this ever evolving uh, uh, situation, there will undoubtedly be, be more to come. Um, other than that, thanks again for being with us. Be safe, everybody. And, and I think uh, the, the one admonition we would have, which I think was the, the guts of what Michelle just talked about is we all need to use a little common sense. So thanks everybody and stay safe.